Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Good afternoon and welcome to the Stonington Free Library's new Thoughtful Thursdays series of talks. My name is Janet Hatton and as both a board member here at the library and a member of the programs committee, I'm very pleased to introduce to you this afternoon's speaker, Laura Jackson, who will speak on Blended Learning 101, the future of K-12 education. Laura is an educational strategy specialist at the Highlander Institute a nonprofit organization based in Providence specializing in blended learning. In that role, she both designs and delivers professional development and coaches elementary and secondary educators on a variety of topics, including blended learning and formative assessment. Laura earned her master's in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and taught middle school English arts in several years in both Boston and in New York City. She also worked for the Rhode Island State Department of Education for the Race uh, to the Top grant. On a personal note, Laura has lived in Stonington Borough for two and a half years with her husband, Brian. In her free time, she enjoys renovating her home, running, and reading. She is passionate about education and this topic in particular, and a fellow Type A personnel. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming one of Stonington's own, Laura Jackson. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to come out tonight. I know the weather is sort of cooperating in that it's not actually snowing, but it's hard to find parking and it's a hard time of day, so I appreciate you being here. I'm so excited to know that there's this much interest in this topic. Um, I know many of you, or some of you, are educators yourselves. Um, many of you have children in the school system or grandchildren. Uh, education is a topic that most people have strong opinions about and we're living in a time where there's a lot of very exciting stuff happening in terms of education reform. Um, so I'm, I'm just very pleased to see a nice full room. So Janet kind of introduced me. I don't think I need to say much more other than to talk a little bit about the Highlander Institute where I work. Um, it's a small nonprofit organization uh, based in Providence and we do work mostly in the region around blended learning, which is of course our topic for tonight. So I thought I would start by explaining what exactly is meant by that term. So you responded to the poll everywhere asking you sort of what school would be like if students all had their own teacher. And blended learning will not deliver a, a teacher for every student, but I believe it will deliver a lot of the same benefits that you would have if students had their own instructor. So some of the things that you mentioned was that it would be more tailored, more personalized, Potentially students would be getting more attention um, you know, they would be able to get away with less because they would have more attention um, focused on them. And those are some of the benefits that we're starting to see with blended learning. Which is, now of course with every term, everybody puts their own definition on it. But this is the definition that the Highlander Institute uses. Um, that it's the st strategic integration of face-to-face -face and online learning. So blending traditional human-to-human -human instruction um, with learning from a computer or an online software. And the purpose of this is to increase students' control over pace, place, path, and time. So what is meant by that? Um, pace is pretty self-explanatory, so students who are ready to move more quickly can do that. Students who need a little more time can move more slowly. Um, place and time having to do with this concept that's um, being talked about a lot now, which is called anywhere, anytime learning. So the idea that with technology, students don't have to be in their classroom necessarily physically to be learning, so they could do a lot of their learning outside of traditional school hours or outside of the traditional school building, as well as um, path. So students do not have to 
progress through content in a linear fashion, they can make more choices about what they want to study and when. So keep that in mind as we talk through um, many of the models that are being used because ultimately the point is not just to have technology in classrooms because it's jazzy and cool, um, but because it, it enables students to do things that they couldn't do before. Okay, so blended learning is a pretty new concept in the world of education. It's really only been talked about for the last decade or so, um, and really much more so in the last three years. But it's not a new concept in our lives. So I think of it in terms of, you know, our everyday life is very much influenced by the use of technology. A lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis involves a mix of face-to-face -face human interaction and interacting with online systems and digital tools. So here are some examples. You know, for me, I think shopping is a very obvious example. You might have things that you purchase on a regular basis or it's not a big investment and you want to quickly just go on to amazon.com, order it, it shows up two days later and you have an online shopping experience. Other things you really want to be able to see physically, like a piece of furniture, sit on it, touch it, talk to somebody about it, so you still go to a brick and mortar store and have that face-to-face -face shopping experience. So when we think about blended learning, it really is about thinking strategically about what can be best taught online and best learned through online tools and software and what could be best taught or is best taught and learned through human interaction and really thinking carefully about that. So it's certainly not just parking students in front of computers all day. So as I said, you know, we live in a blended world, but our classrooms haven't evolved as quickly as many other aspects of modern life. So if you think about a traditional early 20th century classroom, looks very familiar. Um, you know, students sitting in desk in rows, facing a chalkboard with the teacher sort of at the center of the action. And in the early 20th century, the classroom looks pretty similar, um, especially when you think about how much of modern life has changed dramatically. The changes in classrooms have been more subtle. So you might have a whiteboard instead of a chalkboard, or in some classrooms, you might have a smart board. Um, but by and large, students are still facing the front of the room, the teacher is still the center of the action. And the biggest thing, students are learning more or less the same content at the same pace. And this model really grew out of necessity. You know, we're trying to educate a lot of students with a smaller number of teachers. So we came up with this structure of, you know, what they call the egg crate model. One teacher, 25 students in a room. Um, and they had to make decisions that were sort of system centric in order to be efficient. So how do you move this many number of students through? They teach the same content. You have a set number of days of school per year and that is set and the learning is variable. So some students learn very well in this system, but so others either fall behind, they struggle to keep pace with the average student in the class, and others are bored and held back because they're really ready to move more quickly. So we think about that traditional model, certainly evolved, you know, um, we can understand how we used that model for so long, it was really the best option that we had, and it worked for m many students, but certainly not all. And so, in the last 10 years, many educators and parents and um, interested parties who looked around and realized how much their world had changed as a result of technology at our fingertips, started thinking, well, this, this really can't be the best model anymore. Certainly there has to be something we can do to harness the power of technology and make our classrooms um, better able to meet the needs <clears throat> of more students. So I feel like we're really just at this tipping point um, in human history, actually, where this type of teaching and learning is becoming feasible at scale, not just for elite students in very expensive schools, but for public school students in public schools across the country, and that's the work that we're doing. So it really rests on the fact that wireless internet has gotten to the place where it's fast and reliable, for the most part, um, in classrooms around the country. So in the state of Rhode Island, where I do most of my work, there, is a wire, there was a wireless classroom initiative that has brought wireless internet to nearly every classroom in the state and they're working to close that gap. The devices that students are using, so whether that's a desktop computer, a laptop, a Chromebook, or a tablet, are becoming more affordable. So schools can actually start to purchase them at scale, have 
enough to either have you know, a portion of the class using them or even many schools are going one to one, which means every student has their own device. Um, and again, I'm very encouraged to hear that that's happening, not just in affluent districts, but Central Falls is a very small district in Rhode Island that got a lot of publicity many years ago um, for having some very you know, poor numbers in terms of student achievement, um, a lot of tension between the teachers union and the State Department of Ed. And that district is actually currently embarking on a one-to-one -one initiative for grades three through 12. Um, so it's, it's now, we're really pushing beyond technology being a privilege and more to being a right in the classroom. And then finally, the software has evolved. So many of us are familiar with, at least in my generation, we had Reader Rabbit um, and Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, these sort of quasi-educational games. Um, but they were really only good for low-hanging fruit, you know, practicing um, rote concepts, fluency. The software <clears throat> has evolved to the state where it's really an educational tool. Um, and students who are spending time on the software are not wasting time playing games. They really can learn from the software. So that's the context for this new approach, which we are calling blended learning, where students learn part of the time from their teacher um, through face-to-face -face instruction and part of the time through online programming. And really what's so powerful about this model is the fact that it enables it to be it enables a more personalized learning experience and it's more tailored to students, more student centered. So I'm going to go into some detail um, and kind of prove that to you. So there are many ways of tackling blended learning. There are no um, set models really because this is an emerging field. So many people are innovating in all sorts of different ways. But what I wanted to share with you tonight are three of the most common models that are being used. Um, some of which may sound familiar to you. You may be using them in your classrooms or your schools or you, you may have heard about them being used in your children's schools. Um, so what I'm going to do is to talk about the model, kind of explain its features and then give you a little glimpse into a classroom using that model. And you can think about them as a continuum from most traditional to least traditional. So I'm going to start with the station rotation model, which is pretty familiar. Um, it just has kind of a twist on it. So the station rotation model is a variation of a model that's been used in elementary classrooms for a very long time, this idea of station rotation. So the classroom is broken into small centers or stations that students move between. In a blended station rotation model, one of those stations involves online learning. So the first piece of this model is that teachers use student achievement data. So whether that's a standardized test given by the state or it could be a local assessment, they use standardized, um, I'm sorry, student achievement data to create homogeneous groups. So they'll look at their class and break it into, in most cases, three groups to say, these are my students who are on grade level, these are my students who are above grade level and below grade level. And then students will travel with that group through the rotation. So one station would be the teacher working with a small group of students. Our teacher has a very uh, cute little bandana on there, I didn't notice, um, cowboy teacher. So they're working with a small group of students, usually six to eight students, um, delivering a lesson like they would in a traditional setting. So that would be a new concept, uh, practicing something related to the Common Core Standards. And what's really wonderful about this model is that it enables them to work with a smaller group, which not only lets them pay closer attention to what students are doing, they can get more nuanced information about what each kid knows and doesn't know, um, but they can also differentiate their instruction or tailor it. So if they're working with a group that's above grade level, they can move more quickly or push those students into more rigorous content they're working with the group that's below grade level, they might have to build in some scaffolds or do an additional example or two and slow down their pace. Um, and so that's one of the really great things about this model. At a second center, students are doing some sort of um, either independent or collaborative work. So this is typically not new content, they're practicing something they've been taught previously. So they might be working independently, say reading an independent reading book at their level or working on something collaborative like a project where they're applying something that they've learned um, previously um, in some sort of real world application. Or they might use that center to play a game, something where they're practicing their math fluency. 
Um, so that's what's happening at the third center. And then just to go back to the computer center, most students are either using, uh, in the schools that I'm working in, a laptop or a, an iPad. The, the tablets are very <coughs> popular. Um, and students are working on online software that is adaptive to their needs. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is. So this is an example of a software that we use a lot called Dreambox to support uh, math instruction in elementary grades. I think it, it ranges K-5. And so the students are working in this software that is what we call gamified. So they're not answering multiple choice questions. They're playing a game where they have a mission and they have to do math to earn coins and solve these, these puzzles. Um, so they're what they use virtual manipulatives. So students are working on kind of a virtual timeline, I'm sorry, number line, or they might be working with a virtual abacus. And as they're doing their work, the computer is taking in information and adjusting as they work. So if I answer a question correctly, the algorithm in the back end of the software will give me a harder question to answer. If I answer the question incorrectly, it says, oh, okay, she's not quite ready for that. It adjusts back down and gives me something less rigorous to work on. And so it's constantly calibrating so that every student's working at just the right level for them. In addition to that, it's collecting an enormous amount of data on how students are doing while they're solving these problems, much more than any human brain could ever compute. So for example, it will record not only did the student get the question correct or incorrect, but how long did it take them to solve the problem? If they answered it correctly, did they use the most efficient strategy? So for example, if they're being asked to move 18 beads from one side of the screen to the other, did they pull over one at a time? Or did they recognize that they could take a group of 10, move that over, then a group of five, which is just a more sophisticated kind of number sense skill. So it will recognize that. Um, if they made a mistake, it knows kind of, did it make one of the common errors that students tend to make with this type of problem? And it adjusts accordingly. So students would be working in software like this at the third center. This is a purchase software that schools buy licenses to. Another option is to use what's called online playlists. So you may have heard that term before um, with regard to music. So when people started using MP3 players and iPods, they create playlists of songs that you can move through kind of at your, at your choosing. And the concept of an online playlist is that a teacher will curate online content and compile it for a student to work through. So this is a free, again, uh, software called Blendspace that allows teachers to pull content together and share it with students as a URL, as a link. And this one is on the periodic table. So there's a video here that students can watch where somebody's explaining to them about the periodic table. They can look at a website, or I think this is just an image. They can go to a website. This is a PowerPoint presentation that they can look at, um, a link to a website. And then there's an assessment embedded in the playlist. So after the students go through the content, and they can kind of choose, do I need to look at all of these, or do I feel ready to take the assessment? They go in and answer the questions um, as part of the playlist. So I want to quickly show you an example of the station rotation model in action. This is at ASMSR Elementary School in Providence. And I'm just going to show a minute of it, but you'll be able to see each of the centers. Okay. And just let me know if the volume needs to be higher or lower. Two numbers, right? A number okay? in the tens column and a number in the ones column. So boys and girls, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be adding two digit numbers. We're also going to be subtracting two-digit numbers, okay? So we have to pay very close attention today to the sign, okay? Three plus one is four. So now, boys and girls, my answer is 45. Awesome. I got 45 as my answer. How many ones are in my answer? Five. Good job. Show me on your fingers how many tens, how many groups of tens do I have in my answer? Okay, let's look over here. In my answer, how many groups of 10? There you go. All right, boys and girls. You ready to try some on your own? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to write an equation. You can copy it down. Thank you very much for being a helper. All right. So, I'm going to write down an equation. You are going to copy it. 
and you can either use your manipulative or however you want to solve this problem, okay? Whatever works for you. Ready for the first one? Okay. So let's write the numbers. If C3 and U3 will switch together, okay? All right, boys and girls, let's try this one. You ready? 62 plus. All right, so I'm going to cut it off there for the sake of time, but hopefully you get a sense for what that looks like. So you saw her doing her small group instruction, students working on the computers. In that case, they were working on Dreambox, and then um, a group of students working independently at the smart board, um, doing an activity where they were taking turns and doing some math problems together. The next model I want to talk about is flipped classroom model, which is something that's gotten a lot of press. Um, I know it's been featured on, I think, 60 Minutes and other news programs. So I'm curious to know uh, how familiar of a term that is for people. So if you have a sense for what flipped classroom is, go ahead and raise your hand. OK, so we have a, we have a few. Um, so for those of you who aren't too familiar with it, a flipped classroom Let's see. So a traditional classroom involves a teacher teaching a lesson about some concept, like how to do long division. And then, typically, the students go home and practice that new concept. So they take their book home and their homework, and then they turn to you and they say, I don't know how to do this because they don't remember or their notes weren't very good and they struggle um, to apply the content when they're all by themselves at home. So the flipped classroom takes that model and flips it and says, how about instead we have students watch videos to learn concepts and new content at home or outside of school. And then when they come to class, we'll work on applying that content together. So with the teacher there, with their peers there. So this model, sort of it's the brainchild, accidental brainchild of Sal Khan, who is the founder of Khan Academy, um, which, which grew out of this happy accident. So he was, years ago, I think an investment banker working in Cambridge, Mass. And he was trying to tutor his cousin who was having some trouble with math. And she lived in New Orleans. So what he would do um, is late at night when he had a chance, you know, got home from work, he would create these little instructional videos for her explaining how to do some type of math and then post them on YouTube for her to watch. And then when they had time that they could both get on the phone, they would work through some problems together. And she loved it. She, she felt like she didn't feel embarrassed if she had to watch the video more than once or if she had to rewind and hear something again. Um, and she felt like she had a chance to absorb the content before she was asked to perform by applying it. And because he posted it on YouTube, he started getting messages from people all over the world who loved his videos and said, this is awesome, but can you help me with trigonometry? Can you make some videos about calculus? And so he started devoting more and more time to this in the closet of his home and eventually left investment banking and turned um, his whole career towards education and founded Khan Academy, which is now an amazing free online resource uh, full of instructional videos, short instructional videos on a number of topics, and they're free and available to learners all over the world. And so that's where that flipped model really originated. And so many teachers, both in learning about this and with the advent of new free software that they could use to easily make their own videos, have started flipping their classrooms. So a friend of mine, Jason, who's a geometry teacher at Barrington High School in Rhode Island, has done just that. He has a flipped classroom. And so what I want to do is to show you just a portion of one of his videos, and then we can look to see what his actual class time looks like. So hold, please. We all get a little uh, refresher on geometry. Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Appel. And today, we're going to learn about cylinders. Cylinders. So. Uh, we already learned about prisms, uh, and cylinders are kind of like a prism, except that those bases, instead of being polygons, they're actually now circles. So you see here that those two bases are circles instead of cylinder, instead of polygons. So the difference is, when you had a polygon, you had, let's say, a triangle on the top and on the bottom, and then you could connect those vertices, 
we could connect those vertices, and you've got rectangular faces. But now what happens on your cylinder is that when you connect sort of the edges of the circle, there's no vertices. So they all just sort of come straight down, and you get just one surface instead of several faces. Um, and that surface is called the lateral surface. Okay, so you get the idea there. The teacher is speaking directly to his or her students. They can kind of annotate, mark up the video as they're making it. Um, and what they can also do, which I find just fascinating, is embed assessments within the video. So Jason does this where at the end of the video, he has a short uh, multiple choice question assessment that pops up and students are required to answer the questions, which serves two purposes. First, it's some accountability, so he knows that they've watched the video, they've done their homework, so to speak. But it also gives him formative feedback to know what did the class mostly get, what did they not get, what should I clarify tomorrow in class before we get started on our work. So um, in the clip that I'll show, I've actually skipped past that first part just to show you him kind of working with students, but he starts the class with a um, clarifying point from the previous night. get the idea. He spends his class time working with students, listening in on their conversations, um, and there we go, taking in formative data about what they're struggling with, how they're doing, so that he can adjust. Um, so rather than the majority of his time being spent delivering content, being a, a lecturer, uh, he can record that video. He then has it forever, unless he wants to augment it, and he can spend his class time doing math with students, which is very helpful for them and helpful for him because he gets a lot more information and he doesn't have to just spend time grading homeworks. Um, so the formative assessment piece of this, whoops, I think is really powerful. Um, and there are a number of really cool digital tools that facilitate formative assessment. So this idea that you assess as you're teaching so that you can adjust as opposed to at the end of teaching and you find out, well, they learned it or they didn't, but the unit's over and I have to keep going. So this idea of formative assessment um, is really important and it's facilitated by some of these digital tools. So one that I wanted to highlight that I think is just so cool is called Plickers. It replaces these very expensive clicker sets that teachers or schools were purchasing a number of years ago where each student would have a little response handheld device and they would press A, B, C, or D and they could answer a, a teacher's questions. Well, now you can do that with a smartphone. So if you sign up for Plickers, and I think there is a small fee, but each student gets kind of a hybrid high-tech, low-tech, because each student has a little paper card with a unique QR code, like a barcode that you would find on something at the supermarket. It's tied to that student, and depending on how they hold the card, it corresponds to A, B, C, or D. And the teacher, so get ready to have your minds blown, the teacher can just take a picture of the class holding up their cards and the data get automatically scanned, aggregated, and sent to the teacher in an email. So the teacher can, after class, see, oh wow, 98% of my students got the right answer, this one student didn't, I, I can follow up with him or her later. Um, so it's really powerful um, in terms of saving time, efficiency for the teacher, but also for engagement for students. So you can move beyond this method of knowing what students know because you have the students like me who really like to raise their hand and love to be called on and other students who are like, oh good, I didn't have to answer that and I can just sit here. This um, really 
pushes the idea of um, all students have to respond so that all students are more engaged and the teacher can check in with each student. Okay, so we're going to try it. If you have a cell phone, um, it's a really easy question. I don't think there's a right answer. I might have put one in. The question is, which borough restaurant is your favorite? So you can use a computer, but given the way we're set up, I think cell phones are easiest. Um, and to respond to this, this is a little wonky, so you're going to send a text message to this number. So it's the same number as before if you played before. Um, so this is like the, the phone number that you would send it to, 22333. And then if your answer is Yellow House, this is what you would send in the body of the text message. And if your answer is Milagro, you type in this code and so forth. So we'll take just a second to do that. And I think I can pull it up live. Let's see. Okay. I'll pull it back up in just a second. <laughs> you know what? I'll pull it. There we go. Give you a minute to, to respond and then I'll see if I can pull it up. What was the message to again? No. Let's see. So the number is 22333. You just put in your code, that's right. Mm -hmm. So a teacher could use this, you know, to do a quick check. It's not going to get deep. You wouldn't ask, you know, a really analytical question in a quick text response. But if you're doing something where you just want a quick poll to see either a student's opinions on something or a factual answer that they, you know, there is a correct answer, this is a great tool for that. <coughs> Does anyone need another minute? All right, let's see. Yeah, let's see if the tech gods are smiling on me. So, poll, oh, which borough restaurant is your favorite? Ah, oh. <laughs> So we know where there'll be a long line later tonight and we may go somewhere else on, based on that. Okay. So really cool. I mean, it's sort of instant feedback for students, for the teacher. Um, and once again, it's free, which just blows my mind. All right. Okay, so that was the flipped model. Formative assessment is used in all of these models. Um, but the last one I want to talk to you about is the one that I'm most excited about because it's really pushing the boundaries of blended learning into this idea of truly personalized learning for students. And that's the flex model. So this is kind of a bird's eye view of what a flex classroom might look like. It breaks apart that egg crate model where there are 25 students in a room with a teacher and it often uses a big open space where students are working on their devices. So sometimes they're in study carrels like Cubicle City and sometimes they're just laptops at tables. It's very flexible even though in this example they're in rows. Um, and then there's breakout rooms. So students are working on their own content on the computer um, in what is called personal learning time and then they're pulled out into breakout rooms for application activities. So perhaps to have a discussion about a text that they've read or to do a lab or to work uh, with a small group because the teacher can monitor their work on the computer system and know who needs to be pulled uh, for a small group, who needs an additional tutoring session. Um, so that is really powerful. This is much less common, not surprisingly. Um, there, it's gotten a lot of action on the West Coast. Those Californians are always pushing the envelope. Um, and so we do have one school in Providence that's using this model called Village Green Academy, which is a high school. Um, and they love visitors. So if you're interested, I'm sure they would be happy to have you and show you around and see what it looks like. Um, but there's also a group of schools out in the San Francisco Bay Area called Summit Public Schools that are, I think, kind of leading the charge in terms of the flex model and personalized learning. So that's the one I want to show you. I had the privilege to go out there a couple weeks ago and it was really phenomenal. So I'm going to show you a short video of what a classroom at one of these schools looks like. And uh, just to be clear, they are charter schools, which means they're public schools. 
Um, they don't, students don't pay tuition to go there, um, but there are a limited number of seats, so they have a lottery system. So when we were setting up uh, earlier, someone asked me, are public schools or is education in America getting better or getting worse? And I said, I think it's getting better. And I don't know how you can watch that video and not feel optimistic and excited. Um, the energy in that school was fantastic. And I found myself saying like, oh, I want my kid to go to a school like this. And I thought, well, actually, I want to go to this school. Like, this looks really fun. Um, so the day I was there, uh, let's see, so this was a middle school, but I also visited a high school where they had, it was a chemistry class, and they had been working through content online around chemical engineering, and then the project that they were um, working on to apply that learning was to, let's see, they had to create their own company, so they chose who they were going to work with, they named it, they branded it, they designed their own biodiesel, then they actually created that biodiesel in the lab, and then their charge was to write a patent for it and market it. So it was a really um, rigorous and real world project. And I was like, that is so cool. I want to do that. So I think that's the right reaction. If you're looking at what's happening in a school and it looks like fun and it looks like something you'd want to do, that's probably a good sign. Um, what I want to quickly show you, I think I have a little time, is their personal learning plan site. So each student in this model has a dashboard that they log into every day that has all their content for them. Um, so it will, let's say if you're in ninth grade, it will have everything that you're expected to learn in ninth grade in your core subjects online, on this online system, in playlist form. And so you can decide how quickly you move through that content. So if you're a history buff and you just love history, you can spend the weekend getting ahead on your history content and moving through those units at your own pace. If you struggle with math and you take longer for math, you can do that. Um, all your work happens online, and then there's an assessment that you take when you feel ready. So if you start the unit and you're like, I already know this, I'm ready to take the assessment now, you can go ahead and take the online assessment. If you take it and you don't demonstrate mastery, so a certain threshold, you have the opportunity to take it again until you demonstrate mastery. So all that happens online in personal learning time, and then they have those applications um, in class. So let's see. I think I'll, I think I'll just give you the, the idea of it, but if you're really interested in the demo, uh, well, you know what, how about this? I'll do a formative assessment. Raise your hand if you'd like to go in live and actually see the system, see the dashboard. Okay, so just a few. So afterwards, if you're interested, I'd be happy to show you. Uh, but you get the idea. And it's really quite amazing. Um, Summit is the first school that I know of, or group of schools, that has built their own platform. So they didn't purchase something from a company that sells this curriculum. The teachers themselves built their curriculum, which lives on this platform. Now, being in Silicon Valley, they were able to like call up their friends down the street and, ha and hire some software engineers to build this platform, but what they're doing now, which is so wonderful, is sharing it for free. So they are looking for existing public schools who, actually, you know what, it could, it could be independent schools as well, existing schools who want to pilot this model using their software, because they said, we put in 
so much work. We don't want anyone to have to go through the agony that was building this system. Please take it and use it. So that's happening right now. And in Rhode Island, we're trying to get some pilot sites. Um, I think it's very exciting. OK, so to kind of come back to where we started, why I think this is such an exciting time in education. What blended learning does um, is enable students to what I think is most critical is progress at their own pace. And that is, I think, one of the biggest struggles we have in education is students who are falling behind because they're not ready yet and are forced to move on and students who are disengaged because this, the classroom is not rigorous enough for them. So this idea of progressing at their own pace, I think, is really powerful. It gives students access to unlimited online content. And you think about what is at our fingertips through a device like a cell phone. It's really mind blowing. And certainly not everything that is out there is high quality, but we have to teach students and children how to be consumers of what's out there. There's, there's no point in trying to keep it from them at this point. Rather, it's teaching them how to evaluate what they find online, what is useful information, what is not, what's a good source, what's not. Um, we have new ways of having them demonstrate their understanding. So typically, you know, in the past, to show what you know, you either wrote it down or stood up and made a presentation. Um, and that still happens, but now with a lot of um, new apps, new websites that are out there, students can demonstrate their understanding um, through video presentations and through stop motion animation, um, all sorts of really exciting things that teachers are starting to experiment with. They can also collaborate asynchronously. So I've seen a lot of teachers using Google Docs, for example, to have an online discussion. So they open up a doc. It's based in the cloud, so um, meaning that you can access it from any internet connected device. And students can log on at night after reading an article and respond to it together in real time. Um, so that's just a small example of asynchronous um, collaboration. So I might go home and do it right after school. Someone else logs in hours later. We can still collaborate. And then, as I said, receiving short cycle feedback with the idea of formative assessment. So I think we'll just wait for a second. I'm definitely interested in hearing <coughs> your questions and comments. Um, but rather than going through the whole poll everywhere again, we'll just do it the old fashioned way and say them out loud. Um, <laughs> we can still do that. So one question that I thought you might have is, does this work? So. The truth is, we don't know. We think so. So it's very new. There haven't been any you know, empirical studies um, done on blended learning because it is so new. But we are seeing really great results from a number of schools who have kind of been leading the front on this. Now, a number of them also happen to be charter schools. So that's a bit hard to tease apart You know how much of it is due to other factors in that charter school or that charter population versus um, district schools. But schools like Summit, um, there's a chain of charter schools called Rocket Ship, Ship that uses blended learning, Carpe Diem, they're all out on the West Coast and they're posting phenomenal gains in terms of student achievement on standardized tests, which is unfortunately you know, one of the metrics that we're, we're forced to use. It's the best we have to look at big data sets. And then there is an example in Rhode Island um, from a district school. So Pleasant View Elementary is a district, a public district school in Providence, and they won a grant to become the first blended elementary school in Providence, and Highlander was the consultant on that project, and they had the most statistically significant growth on our state test um, in the city of Providence, and the second highest in the state, which is pretty great given that Providence typically lags way behind the rest of the districts in the state. Um, we also have a little anecdote Compliments of Janet sent this to me after Ohio State beat her alma mater. The coach of the Ohio State football team flipped his practices. So rather than spending practice time going over plays on the whiteboard, he created videos, had the players watch them on their own time, come to practice ready to run the plays, and it seemed to have worked out pretty well for them this year. So that might be a proof point, I don't know. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that we, we don't yet know the impact of blended learning, but we know that it facilitates or enables instructional practices that have been proven to be effective. So small group instruction, differentiation, formative assessment are things that have been studied and have been shown to be effective, and those are easier to do in blended models. So finally, 
In my work, what I've seen um, in terms of what it takes to bring blended learning into a school or a district, certainly it requires some hardware um, and some software. But like everything, it's, it comes down to the people. So you have to have commitment and vision from leadership within a school or a district. And you have to have educators who are willing to try because it's new, it's messy, we do a lot of saying, I'm not quite sure, let's figure that out or let's try it. Um, there, there isn't a set playbook to follow. Um, but if you're willing to try a new approach, I think it has the potential to really pay dividends. Um, and then of course you do need wireless internet access. That's the information superhighway that enables all of this to occur and basic devices. Um, but as I said, it really doesn't require the investment that it used to. This is something that really can be taken to scale. Okay, so my boss made me put this part in. <laughs> we are a nonprofit, so um, if you are interested in this work, if you want to learn more, we have a newsletter that goes out. We're also having a conference on March 7th in Providence on blended learning where we're gonna have demonstration lessons. Um, teachers who are using blended models actually come with their students and kind of run a blended lesson. So if you're interested in that, um, you can find information on our website. Thank you so very much. And I would love to hear your thoughts and try to answer some of your questions. Has the blended learning approach been tried in any schools that have uh, teachers unions? Yes. So my biggest contract is in Providence, which has a very strong teachers union. Um, it has the potential, I think, to make a teacher's life far easier. Um, so by and large, all of the teachers that I'm working with and we're using the station rotation model. So the district purchased licenses for Dreambox and Lexia and other adaptive software for reading um, that the teachers don't have to plan that center. So that saves time for them. And they get an enormous amount of data from those softwares. So yes, and it's been very popular. Um, I am a former middle school teacher. English. Um, Me too. What I used to do, I had all low-income students, what I used to do for the first 10 minutes of each period was read aloud to them. <laughs> and they loved it. Yes. And, and they were very interested. So where is room for that in there? Sure. So with everybody in the classroom. But I never had more than 17. Yeah, so this, using this model doesn't mean you never have whole group instruction, um, that you cut out things that are important to you. So I have teachers who say, I still want to make sure there's art in kindergarten and things like that. So you could do whole group reading or read aloud at the beginning of a period and then just make your station rotation part of that, the rest of the remaining period. Um, you could also do it in your small group. And a lot of teachers, I don't know, you like this or not, but a lot of teachers are actually using software to do recorded read-alouds. So kids who don't have anyone to read them a story at night, but do have a device, um, they because a lot of districts are providing devices to students that they can actually take home, they can go on, they can listen to stories being read to them, um, they can actually see the word highlighted as they hear it. So I think what's really great about Blended is that it's not saying out with the old, uh, let's keep what's really good about the old. So if you felt like that read aloud time was important and you wanted to keep it, you should keep it. But if there are things that are better served or that could be kind of offloaded from your plate and let the computer do, um, then that's where this model can step in and I think be very helpful. For those that are a little bit slower, a little bit behind, um, do those kiddos, do they get teased? I mean, is it, is it obvious to the rest of the class? Yeah. I know there's always right. you know, bullying, there's always an excuse for something, but how, yeah. how do they get So treated? I think that you could see two things. In some ways this model can cut down on that because students are able to work, when you're working on the computer and it's adaptive, kids don't know what the kid next to them is working on. So you might be at level two and I'm at level six and it's not obvious to us. You know, so that kind of cuts down on some of that fate, like public um, embarrassment and also with like a flipped model for example a student who needs to watch the video three times before they're ready to go into class and try the problem can do that um, so there is a little privacy in that way um, you know just because it's human nature you do sometimes see kids being like oh what level are you on or I got that coin and you didn't get it yet so there is some of that but I don't think it's exacerbated at all by this model and I think it has 
the potential to be a little bit better. Children always knew who was in what reading group, whether it was red, rock, right. or Right. No matter what you call it, yeah, they're, they're very savvy. How do you smear out that time difference, though, so that the kid that's finished first is not recess first every time? Right. Or something, you know, how do you keep them? So they would do the, the, let's say, if we're talking about a station rotation model, they would still work for 30 minutes. Um, but if we're both in second grade, you might be working on fourth grade math. So, and I might be working on first grade math. So we both have math for 30 minutes, or we're both working on the software for 30 minutes, but you can keep going ahead of your grade level. So it kind of breaks down the grade structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you run into some issues, like at Summit, with their model, the Flex model. Um, what they do is they allow students to work at their own pace in the online content, but they're all doing the same project in class. So students who finish their project sooner have an extension or an application in the same way that you would handle that issue in a traditional classroom. Um, but so I think right now they only let students work on the content for that year, but perhaps they're even able to move on to the next grade level. I'd have to check. Following up on that PACE concept, do you ultimately see high achievers ultimately separating themselves from their original group? Um, so, meaning, that, oh, if you were broken into three well, groups? Um, the low achievers, you know, are going to operate at a certain pace, but ultimately the highly motivated, high uh, intellectual students mm -hmm. are going to move well beyond. Are they going to ultimately be separated from their original group, do you think? Oh, meaning like the, in the next year, would they? Yeah. No, so I think I haven't heard of anybody doing that. For the most part, they would still travel with their age cohort in terms of social skills and you know, what's appropriate developmentally, they would still be in fourth grade. Um, you know, you won't have like a Doogie Hauser scenario where this kid is going to high school, but they're <laughs> in 10. Um, but he might actually be in fourth grade and working on algebra. So, and that to me is a beautiful thing because without a model like this, it's very difficult for teachers to be able to meet the needs of that student who's ready to go. Um, and so, yeah, he can, he can fly. And we do see some students who are very motivated and they log in on the weekends, they log in at night, they enjoy working in the software and so they really are flying ahead of some of their peers. Um, but I say, fly. Yeah. Um, well, I, so I don't have that experience. I, like I said, I work mostly in Providence. Um, the bigger concern we have is about parents and siblings helping because the software is so attuned to their data that if you help your child, it will ratchet it up and start giving them harder content that they're really not ready for. Um, so we have seen some of that, but in terms of pressure, I haven't seen it. But then again, Providence isn't Barrington or Stonington, so I don't, it might be a different context. And on the flip side of that, when you have a, a school like Polk or Roger Williams, and a uh, good friend of mine, How would that work if you have kids in a disadvantaged um, situation where you know, once they walk out of that school, there may not be a parental investment in education. There may not yeah. be that child that you know, forgets about school until the next day at 8 when it shows up. Like, yeah. So, I mean, that's the same problem that schools have now um, with students who, like, their school day ends and they're not either because they're having to babysit, they have to work after school, you know, they, not always by choice, they're not doing homework and that sort of thing. Um, so that's not really any different in this model. So some schools have, in terms of equipping students with what they need, um, schools have, they'll loan devices to students that they can take home with them. Um, some it ran into an issue in, I think they're in, I forget exactly where in California, but an issue where students were having, uh, were worried about carrying devices to and from school because of just having dangerous streets. So they uh, have after school office hours where kids can stay and use their wireless internet and do their homework after school. A lot of schools address it through like community resources. So making libraries and community centers available for studying and homework. They offer wireless internet if kids don't have it at home. Um, but I think in this model, it's really no different than, than how those issues are addressed in a... In a right, to follow up on that, like my, I guess my concern would be, would it be easier for a child in that environment to fall behind? 
Right. Yes. Yes. In this type of... Oh, in this? Um, oh, meaning that because kids can move ahead if they have access, so in terms of equity. Um, I suppose there is an issue there. If you have a student who goes home to a quiet, safe, warm house that has fast internet, they have a device that they can use and they can move more quickly, they have certainly an advantage um, versus a student who doesn't have that. I think the answer is not to not use the model, but rather to try to address those gaps for the student that doesn't have those things. So like I said, kind of using the community, having schools give devices to students or, or loan devices to students so that they, they can access the same things that their peers have as opposed to not going forward with you know an innovative model because it could bring up this inequity. Okay, so I'm going to go here and then there. A then related here. question. When you see these devoted, inspirational, often younger teachers, you wonder, do they get burned out? Is it possible to have a career of 20 or 30 years of doing that because you can just feel how demanding it yeah. is? And if they do get burned out and leave for other things, is this blended learning process one which might keep them in longer? I know that's a difficult question. So it's a great question. It's something I wrestle with. So when I came back from California, we met and we said, okay, so what, what, what are we thinking? And everybody was so excited about it, and I was too. And I said, but everyone who works at these schools has a degree from Stanford and no children. So that's <laughs> not most people. Um, and so can you scale that flex model? Um, so that remains to be seen, but I do think there are things about blended learning that make the job of the teacher easier. I think we've been telling teachers for a very long time, differentiate, meet each student where they are. That is so hard to do. Teachers try and then they burn out and they go crazy and they feel like a failure. So I think that these models actually give tools to teachers that enable them to better differentiate and meet the needs of diverse populations of students. Um, and then as well as using tools for efficiency so grading spelling quizzes will be a thing of the past in a few years because everything can be done online, auto-graded. Um, that tool I showed you for formative assessment, um, you know, doing things faster so that teachers are spending less of their time making copies and grading um, and more time doing the really important things like giving feedback to students. Um, so I don't know, but uh, I think there's potential for it to really be helpful. Okay. <laughs> um, the first one is about um, behavior in the classroom. I think when I, what I see is the biggest issue in the classroom is the teacher's ability to get a handle on behavior management. And so I saw that one picture of the, um, the rotational classroom and I was thinking, oh my God, I can't even imagine that in most of the classrooms that I've seen because they either have teacher's assistants working with the kids in those small clusters, you, I mean, I've never seen it where it's a teacher with six to eight kids and then the rest of them are all in the Right, unmanned. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, that's something that we work with teachers on when we coach them, so figuring out systems for that. Um, we want teachers to be able to focus on their small group and if they're doing this constantly and troubleshooting on the computer and correcting behavior, they're not very able to teach their lesson. So there are systems that we put in place where you have student kind of ask me first tech advisor kids who learn to do some of the basics of getting kids logged into the program and adjusting the volume and we kind of offload that so kids handle it. Um, teachers devise their own systems for how they monitor behavior. Um, there's a very popular app called Class Dojo where um, every kid has an avatar and they get points added and deducted so this teacher can be teaching with their iPad and very quickly you know be entering data into that app. Um, so I think you saw in the video from Providence that it is possible. It's not an exceptional classroom by any means. Um, it just takes, like anything in a classroom, practice. So you start with the students at the third center working independently. They might have a packet of work that they do on their own or an independent reading book. So they're working quietly. A group is on the computer and trust me, they dial in and they are gone. You know, so you don't hear from the kids on the computer and then you have your small group. Over time, we want kids to be working collaboratively, but that's not day one. So that's typically how we handle it. So I guess, and I agree with that's a very helpful answer, but I, the other part that I'm thinking of is, 
does this really fit um, in terms of behaviors associated with special needs kids? So if there's you know, a lot of ADHD in the classroom, and I get that, I mean, kids love to be plugged into computers. And primarily, a lot of ADHD kids do. But um, it just, I guess I'm just, is there any um, behavioral data that's correlated with this? It seems like it has the ability to actually modify behavior. But I don't, I just was wondering if there's any. I don't know of any um, data that's been any research that's been done on that. Like I said, it's very new. Um, but from what I've seen, students, even with behavioral issues, tend to do quite well on the computer. Some kids need to do it in short, shorter spurts. So they might work for 10 minutes, get up, do a lap or whatever, go back to, for 10 minutes. Um, but because it's gamified, or a lot of these programs are gamified, there's stuff moving, they're listening to things, so it's very stimulating. And then you also have teachers working in smaller groups. So it's much easier to correct a behavior when I have six kids in front of me as opposed to 26 and I'm trying to teach and I'm like, put that down, are you listening? But when you have six kids, you can very easily, well, that's an overstatement, you can more easily redirect um, or bring kids back in. So yes, I'm sure there is a child out there for whom this model would not be ideal, but my experience has been that for most of the kids that I'm working with, it seems to be working very well. Right, so I d the jury's out on that. Um, I gave homework as a middle school, eighth grade teacher. I think there's value in learning how to manage your time and work on your own, and, and that can happen when you have work that you have to do outside of school. Um, I think what the research on this does say is that it's developmentally appropriate after something like fourth grade, third or fourth grade. Um, so do fir kindergarten and first graders need to be going home every night and like, stressed out over their packets? Probably not. Um, but I do think there's value in learning how to you know, manage your time. And then as you get into secondary school, there's just often not enough time in the day to cover everything that kids really need in order to be ready. So um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I'm an authority on this, but I think it's appropriate for older students. Right. Ago. Are you finding, or did some found that the involvement, and I know this addresses to some extent, of parents who are learning, specifically in immigration and diverse communities, where they may not have had access to mm -hmm. that learning, that they're actually <coughs> learning? Um, I don't know, I don't know about that, that but it, it sounds completely possible and really exciting um, because as I said it's a free resource and if you're not familiar Khan Academy has courses on you name it from basic math up through um, economics and finance yes like really practical um, things like that so so I actually don't know much about that but I could see that being a really um, phenomenal co-learning experience um, but when Summit when they're when they're using this flux model and I guess that was what is are they, I mean, are they starting to get feedback or have they had any experience with families parents? Yeah, so that's that interesting. It expands the boundaries on the, where they're reaching, so it's not just right. the school center, but it's the more community center. Yeah, I don't know. We didn't talk about that. Um, you know, in terms of parents actually accessing the content themselves, they, they do have access to it. Parents have a portal so they can go in on their own and see where their student is. Um, and they would have access to the content. So I don't know, but it certainly would be possible and would be a great thing if it happened. Uh, this is okay. really exciting. I think your, your issue right and your question comes down to moving it out. So do you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's in nascent stages in various places. Um, is, is there a, a unified effort to capture the data points and sort of rigorously, there's going to be a multi year analysis. Yes. So I don't know of any kind of one central or government-sponsored study that's being done. I know that there is a group out of 
Michigan, I don't think it's the University of Michigan, and I should know this more specifically, who's um, going to be studying the work in Rhode Island that, that Highlander is doing. So I don't think, I, I don't know of any kind of blanket or, or uniform studies, but I think there are um, research universities doing these kind of smaller studies all over the place. Um, but I just don't know very much. Right now we are very much on the ground. Um, but certainly, you know, people, people do want to see that it's working before they make the investment. Um, but in my mind, it, it feels like a no-brainer that this is the way the world has evolved and our classrooms have to evolve with it. Um, the particular model that works well for a community, a school, a district, is that's up to that administration and the teachers to decide, you know, do we really want to go flex or do we want to just start flipping? Um, but I think to wait to see um, would be a mistake because there's just so much potential um, with harnessing this technology. So I got the this for the last question. So you know what, I'll, I'll do one more because I'm a rebel. Last question. Uh, I'm in the pharma industry and we've been actually been using, uh, in a way I've termed it, flexing. Oh really? I've been doing this for several years now. And I was involved in some training in the past. Uh, so this is active in industry right yes. now. Yes, so yep. in higher ed. And I would expect that, I'm actually very surprised that this It's taken this long. Yeah. But as you keep hearing, it's one thing if you're going to make the investment. I would expect that, uh, and this is more of a statement, that if you're going to put in a new program, that with that program would be a, a way to measure success. Yeah, so and we. S that's something that I don't think we see much in education as a whole. Well, or unfortunately, what our best metric are often state assessment results, and those take a year. There's a lag time, so we don't see the results immediately. All the schools we're working in have local assessment systems that we're using that data to say quarter to quarter, you know, are students making at least as much progress as they were previously? In most cases, they're making more progress, but that's only one measure. So we don't think it's enough to say definitively, you know, this is the end all and be all, but we do have student achievement data that we track. Um, and use as a metric. But I agree with you, um, you know, it, it, this feels to a lot of people like, yeah, it's about time. Um, I got all excited about this and went and talked to my dad and he was like, oh yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. You aren't even doing that yet. It was very anticlimactic for me. Um, <laughs> but school districts are slow moving ships. You know, it takes a long time to get people on board, to get the budget in place. So, you know, it's, it's both surprising and not surprising. Um, but just the last point I'll make is, you know, you said you've experienced this as a learner in your professional life, and I think anybody can, anybody who sat through a traditional training where, you know, you have a full day workshop where everybody's moving in lockstep through content that you may or may not need, um, can see the appeal of being able to do things in a more personalized way and to meet your own needs in term, as a learner, to be able to self-assess and say, yep, I'm ready to move forward, or no, I need a little more time with that. So. I'll stop there, um, but obviously I have much more to say about it if, if you want to talk afterwards. And um, I would just say again, thank you so much for coming out and for staying a little late. Thank you.